good to be here, as always. We always look forward to coming, to be with you, and to worship with you. It's, uh, the last time we were here, I had the, the plan was for me to, my brother Dave, prepared for me to speak on Wednesday uh, last year, and the Lord had another plan, and uh, he was taken to the hospital. Well, I remember that we used that Wednesday to pray, and that uh, the whole of Wednesday, we converted it into a prayer meeting. The same way that the people of the old, the, in the time of the Apostle Paul, when Peter was in jail, the church gathered and prayed, and God listened. We gathered here and prayed, and our father listened. And uh, he released our brother back to us. So, Brother Dave, we are... Happy to see you back to us. It is, the Bible says, devote yourselves to prayer with attitude of gratitude. And uh, I, was, I was reflecting, do we make this evening a Thanksgiving evening? <laughs> and I know that the church has been giving Thanksgiving for his coming back. We have a network of prayer warriors across the globe, and we, every one of them took to the altar, and God did only what God can do, and he brought, us, brought him back to us. We are grateful to God for letting him come back to us, that he will continue to do the work that he has given him. That means his work is not finished yet. And that's why he's still here with us. We thank God for that. Uh, in our last uh, uh, report, since, since I, I, uh, September last year when we were here, from there we went to South Korea in October, and then to Nigeria and uh, Algeria, Algeria, uh, Algeria, not Africa. Algeria has uh, become very negative toward Christianity to the point that they uh, had banned bringing any Christian material to their country. Uh, and uh, very hostile to Christians. But the, as the Lord will have it, I had my Christian materials anywhere. Uh, it's always, there's only one option. Send me back or put me in the jail. And uh, either way, his work will continue. <laughs> so the Lord did what the Lord always this is, this, is, this, this is not new to me. Uh, he, the Lord is consistent in protecting me, like uh, my brother Dave said, how God protects me in all the places that I travel. Uh, I had packed my Christian materials in one suitcase, literature. And then when I... As I was about to exit, the custom people, they waved their hand, come, come with your luggages so we, we can search you. I said, God, here we go. <laughs> and they, they asked me to put the luggage on, the, on their desk, which I did. They went through, they searched, searched. All the, all the things they saw were my belongings, my personal items. Uh, and they finished 
They said, they looked at the other box. They said, well, you can go. Just, just go ahead, go. <laughs> they did not search the ones that contained my books. <laughs> That's how God does it. And he stopped them from searching my suitcase. And then, uh, also went to another country that I have been praying and yearning. I have traveled to many countries in the Middle East. I have been to many countries. But this country, Saudi Arabia, is very close to outsiders. They, are, they don't even want visitors to come into their country. They don't give tourism visas. That's how close they were or they are. Uh, because of afraid that we will invade or bring Christianity to their country. But I've been praying. I said, God, <laughs> I need that little crack. And he did. Uh, this year, I had a visa to go to Saudi Arabia. And again, I went my, with my Christian materials. <laughs> Even though they said, red light. So I packed my things and then went. In fact, I went from Egypt. After finishing in Cairo, I went to Saudi Arabia. And in, in Cairo, in Egypt, they have uh, translated our materials. Two of our materials they have translated in, into Arabic. The gospel pamphlet has been translated into Arabic language. So they gave me some of the books in Arabic. So I took it to Saudi Arabia, which would have been a double red line. Uh, one thing is to bring English literature. Now you are bringing Arabic. <laughs> and uh, again, as the Lord would have it, they did not touch my suitcase. I just took them into the country and they were put into use indeed. Meet uh, underground believers, believers who worship under severe, very uncomfortable circumstances. Uh, you have to travel overseas to see how people worship God and what they go through to worship God. We have it so easy here. In other countries, not so fast. I back to one of those countries in, let me not call the name of that country, in North Africa, where I went also last year, what stood out among other things is how they treat Christians. We had a, a family told us that the, the, the government made them bury their loved ones three times. They buried their loved one three times. Could you imagine going through that pain of burying your loved one and then the government comes and tells you, by the way, that graveyard you are buried is forbidden. Christians can't be buried there. You need to go and exhume that body. And then you go and they exhume the body of your loved one and go to another graveyard. And they say, no, 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 no. That's a wrong graveyard. We learned that you just finished burying there. You need to go and take that body out of that graveyard. And then you go back again and they exhume the body of your loved one. That's what people go through for being Christians in a hostile world. That's just a small thing. In comparison, you know, my host and his wife, they had been in prison, beaten, just for being Christian and pastor. It's, we live in a dangerous world. And the good news is that the gospel continues in spite of all this. The gospel continues. Whenever I come to Texas, I always pray, God, what message do you want me to give? I don't just wake up and say, okay, I'm going to say this tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I follow it with prayer. I pray 
I pray and pray and pray because I don't just want to say my word, which is easy. I want to say whatever I want to say. I want to say exactly what the Lord would have me say. Whether it's short or whether it's long. Let it be exactly what God will have me say. Well, what would that be? I'm, I'm giving a title or topic, something I have never given in my whole ministry. I have never given a topic that I will give this hour. And that topic is don't fumble the ball. That's my topic. Don't fumble the ball. All scripture is God breathed. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God might be matured and furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Holy God, here we are as those redeemed by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our mind is so small to wrap around the infinite plan. We cannot fathom the depth of your love that you have toward us. John himself was baffled. That is the apostle. He was baffled by that love that he said, what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Father, we approach you with baskets full of thanksgiving. We want to thank you for bringing and for restoring the health of our brother David, your servant whom you placed here. We can never thank you enough for what you have done through and for and in him. We rejoice that he is still in the land of the living, still ministering and feeding the congregation, the flock that you gave into his care. Father, we pray that you continue to strengthen him and continue to build him up and uh, energize him that he will continue to do your work with the strength that you alone provides. We pray for this congregation that you will continue to build it up. Father, let it be a beacon of light to this community. Encourage your children, even those who may have fallen on the wayside. Encourage them to pick up the pieces and keep walking toward the finish line. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Don't fumble the ball. That is my topic. Don't fumble the ball. When I talk about don't fumble the ball, or when I say don't fumble the ball, that makes sense to you because you know about football. I didn't know about football until I come to America. Until I came to this country, I have no clue about football. I know about football. It's not... It was, it's not your football. It's what we call soccer. We call it football back, back uh, in, in Nigeria, but you call it soccer. We never call it soccer. We always call it football. That's where I grew up. I was a football maniac. I would play back home. We didn't have electricity that you can play and see. You as back home, once it's dark, it's dark. And uh, back home, I could play until I can hardly see the ball. <laughs> and I, we played with almost whatever that is around. Uh, coming from a large family, my, my parents didn't, uh, we were only concentrating in putting food on the table, not to buy you f football. Uh -uh.
So we will play with anything. We will find the orange. Orange becomes football. <laughs> we play with orange until it breaks. <laughs> you get another one. <laughs> and if you see a, a person with real football, it becomes your best friend. You want to be nice to that person. You don't want to anger him. You just, whatever he says, you go along with. Because he has real football. So I, I love football. Played football. I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I was eating and you said, let's go play football, I'll stop eating. <laughs> I'll follow you. And when I came to America, a friend of mine in, in the college said, Moses, let's go play football. I jumped out. So excited. Because I have missed playing football back in Nigeria. And now in America, somebody's asking me, let's go play football. I was so excited. And I was watching him come out. And he came out with that one round thing and holding it. I said, what's that? He says, football. <laughs> I was so disappointed. I said, what are you doing with that rest? He said, watch me, we run around and we throw it. <laughs> I said, that's a joke. Why do you have to carry it and run and still call it football? Football is use your foot to move it. <laughs> that's why we call it football. That was my first uh, cultural shock. <laughs> football. American football. Don't fumble the ball. We live in a time when many people have fumbled the ball as Christians in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is serious. Look at it as you are holding the ball and the ball you are holding is the winning ball in your hand. And you have few, we have 30 seconds left on the clock. And you are running to, the touch, to, the, to have a touchdown. You are running to the end zone. See, I know I have learned a few things about football now. You are running and you are holding, you have been taught how to hold the ball. And you are running for a touchdown. Don't fumble that ball. Because once that time expires, there cannot be any other time put on that scoreboard. And that's it. We are here as God's children. God has placed us here. The Apostle Paul used so many analogies and illustrations to teach us this vital lesson about running to win. He used running the race. He used military analogy. He used so many things to convey to us a lesson that can stick. It is one thing to give analogy with something you, you, you start Scratching your head. Say, what's that? When my mother first came to America, and I didn't know what, what I, I have, that was my first time of hearing the word hamburger. Hamburger. My, my mother came to America and ate hamburger. I never seen hamburger. I never heard about hamburger before I came to the U.S. So she came back. And was giving us this illustration about hamburger. She said, there's one, one thing that they gave me that I ate. They had, it's like a, they have bread on top. And they have, they have things in, put inside it with, with some meat. That was a, a description of hamburger. <laughs> and I, start, I was scratching my head. What, what's that? What can that be? It's one thing to give someone illustration of something the person doesn't know about than to give illustration of what you really know. If I use the word hamburger, you know what I'm talking about. But if I use that word hamburger, when I was still back home, people wouldn't know what's hamburger. 
So Paul will use Paul will use things that people can relate. If it's Olympic, he will use things that people can think. He will think with them. They can fix their mind on what Paul was talking about. And Paul, we have been placed in the family of God as God's children. The moment we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that moment is the moment we have been drafted to run or to play. I, I don't know why. That's, that has been, this, is, this will be my third, uh, third uh, message in a local church beside uh, speaking to the uh, women group that women that pray for our ministry, uh, which we were in their midst yesterday. Uh, that's a, a local, um, it's ju that's just their ministry, where women gather and they put our ministry as their focal point in prayer. So every time we're in town, they will invite us and host us. And we were there yesterday. But apart from that, this is the third local church that I'm speaking of. And my message, I don't know why God, uh, when, I, uh, when I turn around, I don't know why God have me, I don't know why he has this message focusing on running to win. I spoke at uh, uh, Orlando's church on Saturday. That was the topic, running to win. I spoke at uh, Dr. Rose's church on Sunday, and the topic was something similar, pursuing justification by works. Pursuing justification by works. That was the topic. If you, if you, if you were Paul, you would probably be wondering, justification by works? How can you pursue justification by works? I thought we are saved by grace. How, how do I need to ju pursue a justification by works? Yes, if you know the book of James very well, that's exactly what he's asking you to do. Two justifications. The first justification is free for salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But when it comes to the other justification, whereby God will declare you righteous to receive enormous blessings beyond measure, divine work is required. Because when you go to James chapter 2, James used Abraham as a perfect example. In 21, he says, was not Abraham justified by works when he offered Isaac? Well, the question was, when was Abraham saved? Was Abraham saved when he offered Isaac, or was Abraham already saved before he went to the altar to offer Isaac as a sacrifice? And the, the answer is clear. Abraham was already a believer. He was tested. He, he, as a believer, he had been walking with the Lord all his life. And he had grown to spiritual maturity. And works isn't just carrying things, running around. Works is all about mental attitude. What do you think? Is what God considers work. We know that Job glorified God, but he wasn't running around. He was in his house, in one spot. Couldn't go around, couldn't move. His body torn apart. 
by disease. And yet, right there and there, he was exp expressing divine work by mental expression. All the temptation that came upon him, he handled them by mental expression. That's what glorified God. Divine work is what you do with what you have accumulated by way of biblical teaching. My brother Dave, time after again, has been teaching from this pulpit. And we, the faithful ones, have been accumulating this truth. But what you do with this truth is what marks who you are in the, in the Christendom. I've always tell people, it is not what you know that saves you. It is what you do with what you know that saves you. You can know how to control an aircraft. You can be an expert. You can know all the knowledge you have acquired. When the turbulence hits you in the midair, you better not tell your co-pilot and brag about what you know. That's not the time to tell the, your co-pilot, we went to the best aviation in the, in the whole world. In fact, our, our, our instructor was the best in the world. My friend, I know you know so much. You are going down. Unless you apply that knowledge that you know and stabilize this jet. So it's not your knowledge that will keep you from going down. It's your application of the knowledge that will keep your plane stable. So when James wrote to, the, to his congregation, he challenged them. He said, it is not about acquiring this knowledge, biblical truth, which he called faith. People misunderstood that even people on the other side of biblical teaching, they misunderstood that to mean trust in Christ. No, James was not talking about trust in Christ. Rather, he was talking about the application of truth, the body which we call doctrine. James says, if you have doctrine and you don't apply it, what use is it to you? James says, you see a brother in need or a sister in need. Instead of helping and meeting the need of that sister, you tell the sister, go well. The Lord is with you. You quote scripture. All things, God calls all things to work together for good. For somebody who is hungry, that doesn't add up. You have the money in your pocket to give the individual to buy a loaf of bread. You close your pocket and tell the person, Bow your heads. Let me take you to the throne of God's grace. James said, what kind, of, what kind of application of the word of God is that? What well, individual who is hungry, starving, and you have the money, not that you don't have it. What the individual needs is that, give that individual one dollar and ask him, maybe this will help you buy a bread. And that person can say, amen. Instead of you trying to pray. That dollar, he will answer, Amen. Because he, he, he or she has been praying. So application of the word of God is so critical in our spiritual life, in our spiritual work. Returning to Don Fumbo the ball. You have been taught how to run. You have been taught how to hold the ball, which is synonymous to application of the truth in our souls. In all aspects, every aspect of what we have been taught in the Bible, this is the time we have uh, the enemy has intensified to tackle us, to knock us down so that we can fumble the ball. The devil is all at war. 
He's fighting his last battle. He knows that. And he has come viciously against children of God to cause them to fumble the bar. So they will not score. Because he knows that by and by you entering into heaven. Because you are going into heaven has nothing to do with your scoring. You are going to heaven has everything to do with what Jesus did on the cross. No work on your part. When he said it is finished, every work was completed on the cross. We enter into internal state by faith alone in Christ alone. Not by works. The, the devil knows that as well. But what he's trying to do is to make sure we enter into eternity empty-handed. Just think of it. What does it mean to enter into eternity empty-handed? The Bible wants that, especially nobody wants that more than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul warned the church so much. Let's begin from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, the last words of the Apostle Paul given to his servant, uh, his uh, co-laborer, Timothy, Pastor Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. The time of my departure has come. Here was Paul in prison. Paul knew, either by word of revelation, God may have opened a little bit crack and said, Paul, you're coming home. So Paul knew that this, Paul, that, that was not the first time of being in prison, in prison. He had been in prison before. But this time, he knew this was it. And he said that my, the time of my departure has arrived. It is one thing. See, we all have, we have the time now. When I say we have the time, don't think about tomorrow. We have the time now, not tomorrow. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Uh, my, my brother David was a... Brother Dave, thank you. Thank God for bringing you back. And thank God for bringing you here. He, he was... Uh, he, he planned how everything will go last, when, last September. And I was so excited to see him. So I was looking forward as usual but not so fast. That's just a reminder that we are here, like people said, on a borrowed time. Paul worked hard more than any apostle. He said so. He said, I worked hard more than anyone, but not me, but the grace of God with me. This is the mark of victorious living. Here is the mark of a victorious living. In other words, what marks you, you see, it is when death comes, death is inevitable. If Christ delays another hundred years, we will all die. If Christ doesn't come the next hundred years, every one of us here will be gone. So it's inevitable. It is not 
What counts is how we die. Many people die a thousand times before they actually die. They die just so anxious, fearful, frightening, not knowing what their future holds. What knowing, not knowing what they will see when they see Jesus Christ. Not knowing the condition of meeting Christ. So they die a thousand times before they actually die. But not Paul. Just go through Paul and see how Paul died. Say, I have finished. I have fought the good fight. In other words, I did not fumble the ball. I did not fumble the ball. I held the ball so tight. I ran to the end zone. I have arrived to the end zone. I have touched the ball down. I can jump like a somebody who has scored. See how they jump on the field? They jump so high when they do touchdown. Some even do backflip. You can see the Apostle Paul doing backflip when he dropped the ball at the end zone. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the doctrine. I have kept the doctrine. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You see, though the, the, the people who run and win are people who have objectives. People who run and win are people who have a goal. If you don't have a goal, you just be running around. There is no energy. There is no enthusiasm. There is no passion for whatever you are doing if you don't have a goal of what you want to achieve. Super Bowl, perfect example. Super Bowl, they are looking on that cup, which is the, the heart of football. N N NFL, right? NFL. What is NFL without Super Bowl? What's, N what's the meaning of NFL without the Super Bowl ring? You can be the best franchise in the world with many winnings. If there is no trophy of Super Bowl, people don't recognize you that you have already contributed to their community. And that's why every year you see them working so hard. They have their eyes set on winning the Super Bowl. They practice. They do everything that they are required to do in order to win the Super Bowl. That's objective. In the Christian life, what's your objective? If you don't have objective, then you become casual. You come to you come to class when you want to come. You come to church when you want to come. When you feel like, you come. If you are tired, you say, I'm tired. I, I. But a person who wants to win a football, <laughs> want to win, wants to win a Super Bowl, goes and practices every time. He wants to be conditioned. He walks out. He does whatever it will take for him to be declared a winner at the end of Super Bowl. The same thing in the spiritual life. What's your objective? To be victorious, like the Apostle Paul. If that's not your objective, you can just be a Christian. That's it. But if you have objective, it changes your priority. It changes the way you do things. It changes when you have an objective as Christians, 
It will change the way we walk. It will change the way we act. It will change the way we do things as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the challenge. See, I'm not here to preach. My brother does that. I'm here to encourage and to challenge. Paul said, in the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Paul was not selfish. He didn't stop there. And he said, and not only for me alone, but for, for those who are yearning for his appearing. Those, the only ones that can yearn for God's, for the Lord's appearing are those who have finished their work. I remember growing up back home, if my father told me what to do and I didn't do it, my father, I always tell people, my father had a degree. He had a degree. He didn't go to school anyway. But nonetheless, he had a degree in the College of Spanking. My father received PhD in the College of Spanking. If my father spanked you, you would not want him to spank you again. So if my father told me what to do and I didn't do it, and it, uh, you already know why I didn't do it. Guess, guess why I didn't do it? Football. <laughs> Played football until I forget what he told me to do. <laughs> and I will come home late. There was no time to do what he told me. And my father is coming back from, from work. You see me moving around, going, out, uh, going far away where he can see me, I don't want to see him. I don't want to make any contact. I wasn't even anticipating him to come. I wish he would stay maybe tomorrow and something happened and then he would come tomorrow. So I wasn't looking for him to come home. Why? Because I wasn't prepared. I didn't finish what he told me. There was no anticipation of him returning. That's what Paul says here. Not only for me but for those who are yearning for his coming back. The only way you can yearn for his coming back is if you are doing what he has asked you to do or if you have done it. Uh, that is the only way when death comes, you become anxious to see him because you have done what he has asked you to do. You have peace about seeing him like Paul had here. Paul couldn't wait. He said, I have finished. What awaits me is a crown, which is what I'm looking forward to. I can look on the scoreboard. It has been registered. I'm looking for my crown. That should be our objective. To run and to finish well. I'm going to close in by going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Here, the Apostle Paul will challenge the Corinthians who we are not taking their spiritual life seriously. The Corinthians, we are not taking their spiritual life seriously. So the Apostle Paul challenged them here. In verse 24, he said, Do you not know? that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Run in such a way that you may win. So what Paul is saying here is all about winning. He's talking to Christians. If we as believers have lived our spiritual lives and perhaps not serious with our spiritual lives, and if we end our race here on earth and see our Lord Jesus Christ 
without finishing the race, we have wasted our time. And that is into eternity. I don't want to even think about it. I don't, want it, I don't want to think what it means to enter into eternity empty-handed. I don't want that to cross my mind. Because it's not going to be funny. To enter into eternity empty-handed is going to, it's not going to be funny. Uh, and that's why the Apostle Paul scattered all the warnings. In, in chapter 3 of the same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, that believers who failed in their spiritual wa- life, that they are, that all they accumulated, he, he labeled them wood, hay, and straw. And Paul said that they all will be burnt, but that they themselves will be saved. Why? Because their salvation was not based on their work. But then he goes on in verse 15 and said, they will suffer loss, but there will be no reward. And Jesus himself encouraged us. Reward, the, 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 the value of reward in the Bible is everywhere. The Lord himself spoke about the reward, reward in his messages. And Paul spoke even more than that. What's our objective? If we just wander around in this world and left without accomplishing the purpose for which God brought us into this world, we would have wasted our time. And so Paul challenged the Corinthians, and everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Self-control is the key here to winning the race. Self-control speaks about discipline. It is not easy to have competition. We are in a world of competition. The devil wants to cut us. If you are, if you are preparing for a game, and you know that the key is preparation, and if you, if you are getting ready to play for Olympic, and you are getting prepared, let me give you a perfect example. You like cake, chocolate cake. That's your best. You can't, whenever you see chocolate cake, you dive in. But you have, your coach says, no chocolate cake. Don't eat chocolate cake. This time of training. Well, you see chocolate cake, you look at it. You, you look at it one more time. You keep going. You are tempted to go and eat chocolate cake. You say, no. It will make me gain more or it will make me, whatever it is that the coach told you. For that, I have turned my back from chocolate cake. That's what they call discipline. And that's what Paul is saying here. People discipline themselves just to have this rage on their head. And Paul is saying, how much more us who have gay land for all eternity that cannot perish. That should encourage us. That should challenge us. And so Paul said in verse 26, Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. What did I say before? You must have an objective. We must have an objective. What's your objective? To win the race. Paul's objectives, he said, I run in such a way, not without an objective. So we must have objective in whatever we do as believers, guided by the principles of the doctrine that we have learned, empowered by the Holy Spirit who indwells us as we look forward to the finish line. Paul was so consigned. First of all, he told them, run in such a way that you may win. But this time, he's making it personal. I myself, I run. Paul was not saying, I have arrived. You are run. Ministers should not 
consider themselves as those who have arrived. We have not arrived. Brother Dave, am I correct? We haven't arrived. We are still running, running along with the crowd. Just being a minister doesn't mean we are better than those on the, uh, in the pew. We are the same, running in, with the same privilege, the same opportunity. Paul said, I run in such a way that I may win. I box in such a way without not beating the air. But I buffet my body. I buffet my body and make it my slave. See, Paul, Paul did not say, uh, it's very, very interesting here. There are three things, three things that, uh, that go against believers. You know those three things? Three things that go against us in our spiritual walk. The world, the flesh, yes, you got it, you got it right, the devil. Those three things are against us. But the, among those three things, the worst of those three things is not Satan. It's not the world, but the flesh. In other words, we are our worst enemy. The flesh. The flesh doesn't want, uh, the flesh is the one that is killing us. Not Satan. Satan is external. The world is external, but the flesh is with us. Paul, James says, you are in trouble in James chapter 4 because of pleasure. Your pleasure is what makes war against us. This flesh wants pleasure. There is Bible class. There is football. At the same time, the flesh say, forget about Bible class. We can catch up next week. Look at the football. And the flesh goes to football. Your enemy. We must deal with the flesh. Paul said, lest after I have preached unto others, I myself will be disqualified. Disqualified not from salvation, disqualified from the crown. Because that's the context. Run into me. So as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been called to run. We have been empowered to run. We have been given everything we need to run and to run well. Let us run with all the vigor and the power and the strength that God himself supplies. And let us arrive at the finish line and declare like the Apostle Paul, I have finished the course. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment. Thank you for this hour. Thank you for challenging us it is my humble prayer that you will take this word and make it real to us. In Christ's name, amen.